Welcome back to another instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week, where in this video I will be talking about the wicker, charismatic birds that are often attracted to human activity, and are often known as the raccoons of New Zealand, in terms of how they act around the people that are familiar with them. Wicker are among the most iconic of New Zealand's large, flightless birds, and are known to be quite crafty around people. They can have extremely variable plumage, with birds being predominantly brownish red, some birds on the Chathams being tawny, those from Stewart Island being chestnut, and an interesting proportion of birds in fjordlands and offshore islands being almost fully black. At 50 to 60 centimetres in length, and weighing anywhere from 430 grams to 1.4 kilograms, they are about 3 to 6 times larger than banded rails, which are considered to be their nearest flighted relatives, which are also more boldly marked. Birds live and thrive in a variety of habitats, and are known to occupy areas ranging from subalpine grasslands, rocky shores, forests, and even sand dunes, being very adaptable. This helps given their diet, given birds are omnivorous, and have been found to have a diet of around 30% animals and 70% plants. They take up a wide range of animals, like earthworms, larvae, wetter, beetles, and ants, as well as larger animals like frogs, bird eggs, as well as introduced mammals like rats, stoves, and even rabbits. They also play an important role in New Zealand's park communities, being key seed dispersers, being able to do so with larger fruits that would otherwise be too large for smaller berries and birds. Their breeding season varies, though mainly doing so during August and January, with both sexes helping to incubate. When food is plentiful, they can raise up to four broods of around three eggs throughout the entire year, with their nests being made on the ground under the cover of thick vegetation, constructed out of well-woven fine grass or sedge leaves. Birds are also very confident around people, and will often take food scraps and other materials that aren't even edible. Their opportunistic nature has however brought about a debate on their impacts on offshore islands and elsewhere as to how they impact other native wildlife and their numbers, especially lizards, seabirds, and other ground-nesting birds. New Zealand was once full of avian predators, whether that be harsh eagles, owls' harriers, or the variety of other, now extinct rails. Although with most of them now gone, New Zealand's ecosystems are a shell of what they once were in many areas, and this upset, along with introduced mammals taking a more destructive role, Weka too may just push some animals over the edge in some areas. Most mainland studies do not record vertebrates as a large component of their diets, as mentioned earlier being about 30%, so determining how much they impact animals individually is currently scarce. Weka predation is believed to have driven declines of sooty shearwater on Kapiti Islands over the last 30 years, and a weka proof fence was constructed in an attempt to protect their last breeding colony. A population of these seabirds did however continue to survive on the South Island, which still has a reasonably high dock survivorship and fledgling success in the presence of them. Despite initial fears, their predation on the little spotted kiwi population on the same island also seems to have little impact on them, with more kiwi chicks surviving than in many other areas. Cases of the predation on codfish islands, where they do not occur naturally, threaten the survival of the cook's petrol there, and were subsequently removed, the same process having been done on another ten islands where cases like this came about. It seems to be, from what's been studied, that Sweka are more likely to reduce prey populations and numbers when said prey species are already limited in number, and being faced with other threats like habitat loss and predation by introduced pests, such cases being observed regarding the browsing of ungulates in many forests. Their particular taste for understory and ground cover means that native, poorly hunter snails and other such invertebrates have less areas to hide from weka and other predators, and so are more easily taken by them. The way that weka are managed, therefore, is both highly dependent on the situation of a given area and the desired outcome of a restoration slash conservation project, and varying factors like species-focused conservation, biocultural outcomes, and many others all need to be considered to make an informed decision of where and when to introduce weka to said environments. Weka were, and are a part of many of New Zealand's ecosystems on the mainland after all, so eventually they should be welcomed as the general omnivores that they are, although when to introduce them depends on the given region and how biodiverse and healthy it is. Their ability to suppress introduced mammal populations is another interesting thing to look into, given the inconclusivity and varying effects on native and endemic fauna, and the results of looking into this other side of their predation is very interesting. Birds have often been seen eagerly eating mice headfirst in fjordlands on a consistent basis, with some accounts like one in 1966 finding that observed weka ate so many of the rodents during a plague event that the birds' intestines became bound up in fur, which ended up killing some birds. The low numbers of Pacific rats and or curie on Fenuaho in the 60s has also been attributed to weka predation, and European settlers were also well aware of their potential value in controlling rabbits, with some even agreeing that they were even more effective against them than introduced mustelids or poison baits 
The introduction of the former leading to many more problems and damage, both ecologically and economically. Weka are also regarded highly as food by Maori and other groups, with them also providing a great source of feathers for cloaks and other garments, as well as a source of oil to treat inflammation, and are among the reasons why they are introduced to so many offshore islands. This is especially apparent on the Chathams, where thousands of them are able to be harvested each year for food, something which is legal and authorised due to them not originally being native to the area. Despite their apparent hardiness, Weka are vulnerable and sensitive animals, and the populations are subject to large fluctuations, with them increasing during favourable conditions and abruptly declining if they worsen, the main examples being soil quality and food availability. This isn't helped by introduced predation by mustelids, mainly ferrets, which are much larger than the stoves they routinely prey on. Anthropogenic climate change is expected to worsen this through increased droughts and heat events, and through all of these factors, Weka are currently classed as vulnerable, with a decreasing population trends being observed. With more reintroductions and predator control on the mainland, these otherwise hardy birds may just be able to survive, and maybe even more so with people around. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week. For next time, you are able to vote for the New Zealand Storm Petrel, birds which were thought to be extinct which flew in almost out of nowhere back into the limelight of being known to still being alive. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.